It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. Hey guys, Tyler here. There's no doubt in my mind that the words Satan and Lucifer are one and the same within Christian culture. There was a study that was conducted in 2009 where it showed that most American Christians do not believe that Satan or the Holy Spirit exists. The Barna study asked questions about God, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, Satan, and demons. All 1,871 self-described Christians were asked about their perception of God. In total, three quarters, about 78% said that he's all-powerful, all-knowing creator of the universe who rules the world today. The remaining one quarter chose other descriptions of God, descriptions that were not consistent with biblical teachings, such as everyone is God, God referred to the realization of human potential, etc. Four out of ten Christians, 40%, strongly agree that Satan is not a living being but a symbol of evil. An additional two out of ten Christians, 19%, said that they somewhat agree with that perspective. A minority of Christians indicated that they believe Satan is real by disagreeing with the statement. One quarter, 26% strongly disagreed, and about one tenth, 9% agree somewhat. So for today's episode of Comparative Mythology, we're going to answer the question on how Satan and Lucifer became the same entity. And we're going to go all the way back to ancient Greece, starting with the Iliad that was written down by Homer. Now, there's a humongous debate about whether or not Homer was one person or many people, because in earlier centuries, many scholars argue that Homer was not one person, but traditionally a name that was attached to works that were really collectively composed. This theory arose because of the huge success of a similar theory in biblical criticism, and because scholars were able to hear distinctive voices within the Homeric texts. However, more recently, there are some scholars who are once again entertaining the idea that Homer was actually one person and not many people. From what we can tell so far, it seems as though that the work of Homer is actually the earliest depictions of the Greek gods, because after the Iliad and the Odyssey, we got books like Metamorphosis, we got books like Theogony, Work and Days, and the Library of Apollodorus. So what exactly is the earliest description of Lucifer according to Homer's The Iliad? Homer writes down, But at the hour when the star of the morning goeth forth to have light over the face of the earth, the star after which followeth saw room rub dawn and spread over the sea. Even then grew the burning faint, and the flames thereof died down. So the question then becomes, what exactly are the words that are being used for the morning star and the evening star? Now the Greek words that are being used to refer to dawn and evening are herpurus and epurus. Now epurus refers to a dawn bringer, and Herpurus refers to the evening. And according to historical information, it seems as though that there were two separate gods of the stars. And it seems as though that gradually over a period of time, that those two gods of the stars became one single god. It remains for us to speak of the five stars, which has been called Wandering, and which the Greeks call Planet the Planets. The fourth star is that of Venus, Lufarius by name. Some say it's Zuno. In many tales, it's recorded that it's called Herpurus too. It seems to be the largest of all the stars. Some have said it represents the son of Aruna, and for that reason, it's called the Star of Venus. It's visible at dawn and sunset, and so promptly that it's been called both Lucifer and Herpurus. But what about the birth of Lucifer? How did that happen? This comes directly from Theogony. Stara was subject in love to Hyperon and bore great Helos, Sun, and clever Helone, Moon, and Elos, Dawn, who shine upon on Earth and upon deathless skies who live in the wide heaven. After these, Eugenia bare the star of Pergoras, Dawnbringer, and the gleaming star for which heaven is crowded. Also, according to Metamorphosis, it seems as though that Lucifer, during the Greco-Roman period, also had children during his lifetime. Peleus was lucky. Lucky both in his wife and his son. 
and all went well for the hero except for the guilt he incurred in the murder of Phocus, his half-brother. Banished from home with the blood still fresh on his hands, he finally found a welcome in Trachis, a land that was free of bloodshed and violence under its ruler Ceyx, Lucifer's son, whose face most often reflected his father's brightness. But then it was overcast with untypical gloom because he was mourning the sudden loss of his brother. He passed through the gates of the city with only a handful of followers, leaving the flocks of sheep and the herds he had driven along in a shady valley not far from the walls. As soon as he gained the chance of a royal audience, he entered the hall as a suppliant, holding an olive branch wreathed in wool, and declared his name and the name of his father. The only thing he concealed was his blood guilt. His exile was falsely explained away. When he asked permission to earn his bread in the city of Trachis or out in the country, Ceyx gently replied, This kingdom welcomes all strangers. Our comforts are open for even the humblest of folk to enjoy. Kindness apart, you're a famous man, and Jove is your grandfather, powerful points in your favor. You need not ask for assistance. All that you seek shall be yours and whatever your eyes can see you may call your own, for what it is worth, though I wish it were better. Ceyx was weeping. When Peleus, backed by his followers, asked him what was causing him such distress, he told them his story. Ceyx's Story, Didalian Look at that bird of prey in the sky upsetting all of the other birds. Perhaps you suppose that he always had wings. He used to be human, already a sharp-eyed, violent, and warlike creature. Character seems to survive any transformation. His name was Didalian. He and I were sons of the star who summons the dawn in the morning and vanishes after the others. Mine was a peace-loving nature. I cherished peace as I cherished my wedded life, but my brother's delight was in brutal warfare. His manly courage was shown in the conquest of kings and their peoples, where now, in his altered shape, he pursues the doves of Boeotia. He had a daughter, a girl of exceptional loveliness, Kyone, wooed by a thousand suitors and ready for marriage at fourteen. One day, when Apollo and Mercury, Maya's son, were returning, the one from his temple at Delphi, the other from Mount Silene, both at once set eyes on the girl and were fired with passion. Apollo deferred his hopes of enjoyment until it was night, but Mercury couldn't endure to wait and touched young Kyone's face with his wand of sleep. She yielded at once to his magic and so he was able to rape her. The sky was dotted with stars when Phoebus disguised himself as a crone and stole the pleasure his brother had taken before him. Nine months went by, and Kyone, pregnant by wing-footed Mercury, bore him a son, the knavish Autolycus, wily and skillful in every kind of deception, a rogue who was thoroughly versed in his father's arts, and perfectly happy to turn pure white into black, jet black into white. Kyone's son by Apollo, she actually brought forth twins, was called Philammon, famed for his singing and skill on the lyre. But what is the use of producing twins, of having attracted two of the gods, of being descended from such a brave father and starry grandfather? Glory, perhaps, is often a snare. It certainly was so for one, since Kyone ventured to claim she surpassed Diana and moved the goddess to violent anger by finding fault with her face. No doubt she'll be happy with facts, Diana retorted in fury, and instantly drew her bow to release an arrow which pierced the tongue of her wicked traducer. The tongue went silent, the voice was lost, and the words wouldn't follow. As Kyone struggled to speak, her life flowed out with her blood. I, 
Her poor uncle Ceyx wretchedly cradled her body and grieved as a father might. How sadly I broke the news to my brother who loved his daughter so dearly and tried to console him. Didalian seemed to respond like a rock unmoved by the crash of the waves. He was utterly sunk in grief for the loss of his daughter. But when he set eyes on the pyre with her burning body, he tried four times to throw himself into the flames. Four times he was beaten back. Then he took to his heels in a frenzy and rushed all over the fields like a bullock stung on the neck by a swarm of hornets. Already I fancied his running was superhumanly fast, and you might quite well have supposed that wings had grown on his feet. Didalian managed to dodge us all. In his longing for death, he ran right up to the top of Parnassus and jumped from a precipice. Phoebus, in pity, transformed him into a bird and suddenly raised him suspended on wings in the air. He gave him a hooked beak, talons to claw at his prey, the courage he'd owned from his birth, and a strength more powerful than you would expect in so small a body. Now he's a hawk, a mischievous creature who vents his rage on the kingdom of birds and inflicts his pain and distress on his neighbors. So when did Lucifer first appear in the Bible? The book of Isaiah was first written down between 739 and 681 BCE. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, who didn't weaken the nations? When it comes down to the idea of Satan, he makes his first appearance in the book of Job. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. The Lord said to Satan, Where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not hand around him and his household and everything he has? He has blessed the work of his hands, so that his flocks and herds were spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. When you translate the Hebrew into English, it seems as though that Satan refers to accuser or adversary. And in this particular context, it seems as though that God has Satan as part of his divine counsel when they were going to attack Job during that particular context in that story. But what's also interesting is the development of Satan throughout the whole entire New Testament. Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and when he fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterward, he was hungry. Now the temptation came to him, he said, If you're the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up to the holy city, sat him on the principal of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, show yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. The final development comes directly from the book of Revelation. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven. He had his hand a key to the hole without a bottom. He also had a strong chain. He took hold of the dragon, that old snake, who was the devil or Satan, and chained him for 1,000 years. The angel threw the devil into the hole without a bottom. He shut it and locked him inside it. He could not be full for the nations anymore until the 1,000 years were completed. So what did we learn today? Originally, the snake was not part of Satan in the slightest, and we also learned that Satan was once part of the divine council of Yahweh. We also learned that Lucifer was once part of the Roman Greco mythology before being adapted for the Bible. And we finally learned that the ideas of Lucifer, Satan, and the snake combined together in the book of Revelations. So what do you guys think? Tell me in the comment section down below. And as always, I'll see you guys in the next video. It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler. He's your only black friend, so he's your best black friend. I wouldn't trade him for another black friend. Be
Because black friends are rare as you should be aware He smiles like Richard Pryor so just sit and stare It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler It's everyone's friend, it's Tyler